Greetings, comic book fans, and welcome to episode 14 of The Polis Podcast, a bi-weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. My name is Chris Poirier, and here with me, as always, is the one and only Hector, as seen on episode 3 of DC Universe's The Swamp Thing, Mirai. <laughs> That's going to get old soon, dude. Uh, yeah, but I can add episode three to it now, and okay. we can talk about the Swamp Thing news that we have later on. So, Hector, sure. welcome, as always. Many thanks. But, but wait, fans, there's yes. more. We actually have another special guest. Unbelievable. Uh, for our second official interview here on the Poll List podcast, we have Tamara Robertson. Hello. Yay. Hello. Yay. <laughs> and there's clapping. Yay. We'll insert the track later. It'll be wonderful. Yes. Yay. <laughs> but strap in, everyone. Prepare yourselves for We Have Comic Sign. You better put the word out. Can't wait for the nerd out. You better put specs on. On today's episode of The Pull List, we've got quite a show for you. We're going to hit the latest news in the industry, a few of our favorite polls from the last couple weeks, and then we get a awesome unique chance to be able to learn what the amazingly talented Tamara has been up to so let's get this kicked off and Hector let's get to the news how about you tell us a little <laughs> bit about Swamp Thing because uh, that's kind of been in the news this week so uh the world kind of kicked off this week uh freaking out a bit over the fact that DC Universe's Swamp Thing has been cut from ten episode or from thirteen episodes down to ten episodes, um, the cast was abruptly informed, like mid shooting, and uh, you know people really went right off the deep end to saying, "Oh no, DC Universe is canceling." They're scared of Disney Plus, and it was you know, a, you know, the hype train took off very quickly. Um, but really, quick, funny, uh, less than about four hours after that broke, DC dropped their first trailer for Swamp Thing. Um, which to me was just like, calm down, people. We're okay. Yeah, everything's um, fine. Everything's fine. Nothing is broken. Um, which, I mean, realistically speaking, 10 episodes of an independent streaming site for a show like Swamp Thing isn't a bad life choice. I mean, it's, it's you know, you got to pace yourself. Um, but, you know. <laughs> right. It was slated originally for 13 episodes, right? So they only it, really cut three episodes off the back end. They cut three episodes, and um, what was cited is that it was cut for creative differences. Um, you know, if you've listened to this before, you know, and it's Chris jokes about, I was on, I filmed for the show for about three days, just background stuff. And um, so I'm still on the casting call information and sheets and stuff. And the day that they dropped the big announcement, they sent an email out to all the cast, and it just says, uh, uh, I know given the news earlier this week, everyone is likely curious about what is happening on our end. We still do not have definite word, but it looks like though, uh, though we will be filming pickups and a new ending to ep ending to episode 10, at least through next week. So they're going to be filming through next week. It says uh, we will have very little heads up on what is needed and when it is needed. So please keep your eyes peeled. And um, it, they, he just goes on to thank everyone that was a part of the process. And so they're changing the ending, but to my everything I've seen so far from DC Universe has actually been incredibly solid, and I'm not exactly scared for the outcome. And yeah, you know, I get it. Everyone's going to jump on you know Disney Plus. It's got Star Wars and Marvel, and yeah, it makes sense. But I don't feel like the world is over for DC Universe. No, I kind of had the same impression that I was like, "Hey, man, I, I'm really excited to see the Mandalorian. That looks freaking awesome." But that was more so I'm just opening my wallet and dumping it out so that all of my cool geek coins could fall out so I could buy more awesome content as opposed to one over the other. I, I mean, I get they're competing for our dollars and our, and our space and everything, but it, can't we just enjoy all the things? We can't enjoy all the things if they keep charging us money because we've basically reverted <laughs> back to what pay cable was in the 80s where you had to pay a monthly subscription for every good channel. Oh, now and I'm sad. We, we've effectively come full circle. We went from here's a whole world of content for a relatively affordable price to now everyone has to have their own streaming service. So great and terrible all at the same time. <laughs> I will say this. DC has been doing some other things. Uh, you're familiar with Young Animal, the wonderful imprint over there that Gerard Way has been uh, curating there. 
Well, they announced that they're coming out of hiding. Uh, they have three new titles that are going to be hitting the shelves later this year. So they introduced that, of course, Doom Patrol will be continuing, um, but they're calling it Weight of the Worlds. It's a very specific arc that's going to be done, and some of the creative team is mixed up a bit. Um, Nick Darrington, I don't think, will be doing primary art anymore. He'll be doing covers, but I've seen that they've added folks like Becky Cloonan and other friends of Gerard that is just awesome. And then two new books called Far Sector and The Collapser, which I don't know a ton about, but I know that if you are a young animal fan, stay tuned because more stuff is coming out of that side of the DC universe. So we have much to be excited for in terms of that. And I, I just want more Doom Patrol since watching DC Universe, speaking of which, um, has been really great. And I just want all the things Doom Patrol. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, like Doom Patrol to me is a lot more palatable as a TV show than a book. Not that it's not <laughs> a good book, but it's just the weird and the quirky translates a lot more to performances and audio than it does just on paper to me personally. That seems to make sense. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely some concepts in Doom Patrol that understanding Danny Street or Danny Land, depending on the iteration that you're reading, probably is really difficult in print until you get a full concept of exactly what's going on. Or a universe inside of a donkey. I mean, you know, things like that. Yeah. So what else is in the news? Well, I think the only thing worth mentioning today, because we really want to focus on our wonderful guests, is Doomsday Clock number 10 and 11 delayed again. It's Surprise. Yeah, literally, I think the past five podcasts, we announced that, that it's de delayed. Like, I think they're, literally the past five, they're out to 11 weeks. And it's kind of a joke, actually, over at Bleeding Cool, that they're just going to keep a running updated po uh, <laughs> blog <laughs> just open <laughs> for updates on how much more it's going to shift. It, it makes me sad inside, but I I'm ready for it to to do its thing. <sighs> Eventually, we'll have wonderful news uh, for our news segment. But I mean, new stuff from DC Young Animal. That's a positive. I'll take that. Right. right. That's the news for us this week, uh, sports fans. And as always, you can join us in the conversation. Hector and I and all of your nerdy friends over at the Love Thy Nerd Facebook community. Just search for Love Thy Nerd community there on the Book of Faces. Hit join and begin your geeky adventure together with us. Uh, tell us what you liked, what you hated, or possibly just what we missed. We occasionally miss things, and we're a little short on news this week, but we always want to take that opportunity to be able to hear from each and every one of you. Which leads us to the next most important thing that we discuss here on the show, and that's what we're reading. All right. So what are you reading? I... I'm still absolutely loving Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil 4 came out, so Chip Zdarsky's run on Daredevil is running. And, of course, we've talked about a few episodes ago the fact that Daredevil has finally, though accidentally, killed um, somebody. Instead of just knocking him out and tying him up, he has actually murdered someone. And as part of this arc, he is sought out by the Punisher, <laughs> and the Punisher saves him from a police officer who's trying to catch him for um, Mayor Fisk. And the Punisher's like, I guess I completely underestimated you. And so the entire uh, issue for number four is Matt and Frank having a interesting conversation about the difference between their approach to vigilante crime fighting. Okay. Um, I it's, saw you post some stuff and I'm relatively I, I kind of hate when you post things because I'm not trying to buy another book right now. And um, I'm but, here to make to make you buy more things, even though I no longer manage a shop on a day to day basis. It's because I love you and all of our listeners. But like the stuff you posted <laughs> today was like, ah, crap, I'm going to be spending money. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, Daredevil you're is looking really solid. Uh, I am excited about it. And my other poll for this week that I was really excited about that I didn't think I would be was Star Wars TIE Fighter came out this week along with the Star Wars <laughs> Age of Rebellion. You know what? <laughs> I Go actually on. like where this TIE Fighter story is going because it's being told entirely from the Imperial Navy's perspective and a squadron of TIE Fighter pilots 
and it appears to be somewhere in the middle of the storyline of New Hope. Okay. Um, at least that's what I'm guessing because like one of the moments is literally the pilot squadron having like lunch after a mission or something. And on the Imperial news is Alderaan just going to bit, bits and pieces in the background. Mm. So I was like, Oh, that, and that was background to a panel. Yeah. Um, well done. So, yeah. So they're t- also talking about kind of, you know, their families, their relationships and how the rebellion is viewed from their side. So I think it's going to be an interesting little story and it looks like it's going to be a mini because it's at, it, it's not a, the end there, there's more to this story. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. Cool. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of other really cool stuff out this week. Uh, still reading middle West and black badge and all my favorite little off the wall things. Uh, Gideon falls is just straight up bonkers right now. That was yeah. the horror sci-fi ish type thing from <laughs> Jeff Lemire. And yeah, I, I just don't know what you got. Um, I think my top two for the week, uh, Batman 69, which personally, I'm just glad to see the nightmares arc over or ending. Um, and as many people are, as much as I love Tom King, this is six issues of this or however long it's been has been a bit of a stretch. Um, but I've really enjoyed the little <sighs> subconscious journeys of Batman and dealing with the nightmares that uh, he's going through while, uh, you know, Thomas and Bane have had him. Um So I've enjoyed that, but I think what made me most excited was to finally get a glimpse of what's been happening while he's been in his nightmare state. Um, But thank you, Tom King, for what, eight issues later, finally reminding us that Thomas Wayne is still part of this story. Yeah. But um, to bring us out of the nightmare state to naked Bane wrestling Batman's dad, I don't like. I legit don't still I'm still processing that as I just read it this afternoon. I'm like, is this our nightmare? Is this yours? <laughs> is this Batman's nightmare? Like that his greatest enemy is re- wrestling nakedly with his father. I mean, it's just like, OK, I get it. I mean, this isn't the first time Bane's just been strutting naked through his, the Batman arc. But I mean, it's just weird. Um, comics but I, are weird, but the comics are weird. But I've, I've we actually, I really enjoyed uh Thomas Wayne sunning Bane basically for lack of a better term. Um, and just that relationship, but man, uh, their interaction was pretty cool. I, I really, I think that was my favorite part was seeing Bane and Thomas Wayne interact. Um, because it didn't seem like there would be a solid motivation for the two of them to function together, but yeah, man, they've, they were seriously, uh, there was some twisted ish there and it was pretty cool. And um, some, something's coming as a result of that. That's all we yeah. know. Yeah. Something's coming as a result of that. Um, beyond that, the other thing was Hawkeye number 19, which don't, you're not wrong. I'm totally, that's a super old issue. Um, uh, April 15th, which is tax day is also American sign language day, which I was not aware of when that was. I knew it was a thing, but I didn't know what day it was. And one of our, one of my avid readers, um, and a friend of mine uh, is a interpreter and a oh, translator. Awesome. Um, and she, her full time job is uh, interpreting live, like live interpreting movies at the theater for the hard of hearing and the deaf. And so she's oh. a big advocate of that. And so she posted something about it and I was like, you know what? I have not spoken about ASL from my perspective you know, from faith and fandom page or anything like that. So I was just doing some, some research on ASL representations in comic books and came across the fact that, uh, Matt fractions, Hawkeye number 19, which was from a few years ago, um, that I'd forgotten that Hawkeye is deaf, like Canon. I mean, I think most of the world that doesn't read a Hawkeye comic book has forgotten that fact simply because he has, he's not represented that way in almost any format other than a few stray comic books, you know, it's True. not it's none of the movies or the TV shows or the cartoons or anything really put that out there. So um, you it was just a really brilliant take of looking at uh, being a person of heart that's hard of hearing or deaf in a comic book panel. The fact that uh, when someone's talking and they're not making eye contact or intentionally communicating with them, that just shows up as blank word bubbles. And um, I thought, you know what, that's that's a really great way to draw awareness to that, but also that, uh, in between some panels, they'd actually straight up have, uh, some panels of sign language 
and uh, doing that. And so I had a really good time reading through uh, Daredevil number 19. Um, if you want to just check that out for the interest value of it, I'm sure you can pick it up at a local shop or on Kindle uh, or Comixology. It's only 99 cents to pick up that issue standing alone. Um, so that was just the issue I really enjoyed reading. Also, you know, Nightwing is actually still doing really well for me. Um, and then uh, Cult of Carnage, and I picked up Attack on Titan and reread or and caught up on where Attack on Titan is. And, you know, so that's been fun, too. So that's that's been kind of my pulls for everything else. Wow. I, I guess I need to go back and check out that Hawkeye. But I mean, I love Matt Fraction and the work that he does. So it's really neat that they'd take that approach on that book. So well, thank you for as always, you seem to dig stuff out of the backlog that is worth reading. So I know I appreciate that. Well, and that's the thing. I've, I've heard Matt Fraction's name a ton and I've read a lot of stuff that he's done, but I had no idea they did a whole arc um, using sign language and portraying Hawkeye's disability in that capacity. So it was really cool. That is really neat. So, uh, Tamara, you've been you've been quiet. Um, but is there is there anything um, that you've been reading that you'd like to share with some of our listeners? Um, I think for me, one of the biggest reads that I still do is Unstoppable Wasps, the series by Jeremy Whitley. Um, it's something that I share with my fan base all of the time because I love what he's doing with normalizing inclusion and diversity uh, in the comic world, in the STEM world, bringing these young women uh, into this universe where they're utilizing science and technology to take on not just everyday problems, but also, you know, the, the supervillains of the world. And his latest run has been something that to me especially has been um, very heart touching because he's, we're seeing through this, this new um, last couple of issues, Nadia actually dealing with bipolar disorder. And right. it's something that he is portraying so well throughout the comics you know he's he's showcasing mania and depression in a way that is is truly on point with what it feels like to be in it as well as showcasing how people don't understand it from the outside as her friends and um her family they try to they try to support her and try to get her through these moments and it's been something that i think has been enlightening for for myself for the readers to not only one see something that a lot of people just pretend doesn't exist when it affects a large amount of the population um come into a full light and be shown so well but also to be kind of given the resources um and the knowledge base to mm -hmm. then look at it and be like hmm i wonder if I have friends and family that are going through that. I wonder if I'm going through that. You know, it's it's enabling a mirror that a lot of young readers, um, for sure, have not seen before, I think. Um, it's not something that you see a lot done in comics, you know. And it's funny because the comic world is one that is, in fact, riddled with, you know, mental health issues and self-care needs and post-traumatic stress disorder. And yet... It's something where we, we bring these um, heroes out of these huge battles and we we seldomly talk about the impact to them. So seeing Nadia go through um, bipolar disorder and having to live through, you know, the repercussions of being in the red room and what she's faced in her life, I think has been something that has taken the series to another whole new level. You know, for me, it was always, oh, I love that these are girls that are using science and tech and they're young and they're fighting the patriarchy and they're showcasing that they can do anything that they set their minds to. And then to add a whole nother level to it of, you know, showing the importance of self-care and self-awareness and awareness of those around you and, and what it takes to really be there for the people that you care about has just been a really inspiring, uh, arc in this story so i'm every time the issues come out i'm just like you know going through the pages because it's like i want to see the science i want to see the tech i want to see the amazing fashion that nadia and her friends rack, um you know wear but i also just want to see how these you know how these characters are going to get through it and i know in talking with jeremy that it's not been an easy thing to do to his characters or his readers but it's something you know that that has to be has to have a light on it and i think he's doing a beautiful job with it 
No, it's it's one of the things I miss since my relocation out of North Carolina that I would get to see Jeremy on a weekly basis uh, in the shop and he would tell me about things he was working on before they hit the page. And just hearing his passion for the work that he does and the things that he focuses on always just warmed my heart as a shop owner and now just as a regular day-to-day fan that he really cares about his characters. He cares about what he is communicating to his fan base. And for those of us that know all the little bits and pieces, it it's also really fun because um, our good friend, um, Matt Connor actually consulted with him a lot on that and helping that appear the way um, that it should be and be well handled. So it it's really fun to know that my North Carolina family is doing really awesome stuff in comics right now. And, uh, it, it is such a great thing and we'll definitely drop a link in the show notes. So folks can check out that series. And honestly, um, I'm working on probably having Jeremy come and visit us here on the podcast so we can hear from him, uh, kind of what's been driving him on this stuff. Uh, cause he's, he's a fascinating guy and I just love hearing his heart as he works out some of this stuff. It's really good stuff. That's a great recommendation right there. He, it sounds like he's doing a better job addressing these things than Heroes in Crisis is doing. Um, <laughs> uh, the New York Times wrote an article on issue five of the recent run, specifically calling it out. So it, you, you could say a case could be made. That's pretty um, cool. It is pretty freaking neat. Um, so that's kind of what we've all been reading uh, for this particular week. As always, on Wednesdays, normally we would feature one of you lovely podcast listeners in this spot with your read. But as we said at the top, we want to be sure that we give lots of time to this awesome conversation that we have lined up for you today. But don't forget, join us in the community and you can tell us what you're reading and you might be featured right here and telling all of the wonderful listeners of the Pull List Podcast what you've been reading. So now, Hector, Tamara, mm-hmm. yeah. are you ready mm-hmm. for the main event? <laughs> Yes. In, the main in, yes, the main event the main event is like you. Wrestling intro music and stuff. <laughs> I feel like we should. Um Tamara, what would be your your like uh entrance song for a main sporting event or something? Uh I think I would have to just go with the WWE Let's Get Ready to Rumble. <laughs> like oh. Nice. oh, well played. Okay. Nice. <laughs> we can do that. Well, for for all of our wonderful listeners who have not had the pleasure of meeting you, how about you give us a quick rundown on who, 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 who is you? Oh, it's such a great question. <laughs> I think it's evolving daily. <laughs> um, no, so I'm Tamara Robertson. Um, I've been the the female part of the new Mythbusters relaunch over the last four years and Coming up most recently was our uh, Mythbusters Junior, where I got to join Adam Savage and six amazingly intelligent kids from across the nation on taking on the normal explosive myths that we're used to seeing. Um, those of you that are prank fans may know me from Psyjinx with uh, Johnny Galecki, um, but basically just been spreading my, my, my science and engineering know-how on the science channel for the last four years. And then when I'm not filming, I'm going across the nation doing superhero science at all the comms, you know, San Diego, New York, North Carolina Comic-Con is my family. So I come back each year. Um, and so just kind of doing that as outreach and, and just talking science wherever anyone will let me. <laughs> Yeah, just just a few things, nothing major. A couple yeah, TV shows here, some comic cons here, San Diego, New York. You know, little shows you might have heard of. Um, and it's it's one of the things that I've always loved about you is the amount of energy that you bring to everything that you do, um, and just you're you're one of us. You're one of us nerds like everybody else, and it's it's one of the things that we all enjoy celebrating, especially those of us in North Carolina that have spent time in the North Carolina comic con environment and everything that it, the best thing about cons and Hector and I talk a lot about this is the community it creates and the, the friendships that we make and the people. And I've come up with this strange analogy of it. I feel like this must've been what 
like um, circuit performers in either vaudeville or like circus acts back in the day must have felt because we hit a new town and it's like, hey, you run into another group every now and then, depending on the con, you catch up um, like your old friends and then it's on to the next show and you might see some that weekend, you might not. It's just like unlike anything else that we've ever experienced. But kind of off from that, what what is your favorite part about doing conventions? So for me, my favorite part about doing conventions outside of getting to talk superhero science, which honestly is probably my most favorite part, um, is getting to actually talk with the other cosplayers. So I do this thing called cosplay hide and seek, where if you're able to find me, I have a science pack full of like autograph stuff and just really silly, like dinosaurs and parachute men and just really silly stuff. Awesome. Um, <laughs> it turns out, by the way, if you give Chris Sims a Bernoulli's principal pipe, he will shoot a ball across the room within 10 seconds. So just as an awareness, that don't share science with all. comic book writers. <laughs> um, but <laughs> So for me, what I love about doing that, though, because I had a couple fans are like, you know, why are you hiding? Because you don't want to see us. And I'm like, actually, I hide because I see you more like the cosplayers mm. and the makers are so much more open to talking when they think that you're just a regular cosplayer behind a mask, you know, which I am and which I used to be before I became something, you know, more than that. And so in my heart of hearts, I'm still that maker that loves to dress up and embody characters and just have a blast and so i found that when i walk the floor and my cosplays i'm able to really talk to people about the amazing love that they have for for the universe that they're they're cosplaying and love for the character the the passion for the build that they did for their cosplay like it's always just so incredible to be able to get down and really talk with all of the fans on the floor because that perspective and that passion is what keeps this entire, you know, comic world alive. And it's why we all love it, right? It's not just, you know, the, the actual reading of it, but it's also the family it creates. You know, I remember my very first Comic Con was four years ago. I had a young fan of Mythbusters be like, Will you come to WonderCon with me? She was like 16, willing to show me around. And I'm like, Sure, I'll come. And I like, like researched what what character I would be and I decided to go full fledged painted starfire built my own cosplay learned what cosplay crunch was very quickly and showed up <laughs> yep and was like in this room full of my people and I'm like oh my gosh my people meet in a place and I didn't know this and it's been just this <laughs> eye opening family for me that especially in a city like LA where most people are transient and they're just going from one thing to the next and it is very hard to set up community to have that Comic Con cosplay community here has has given me those roots you know and so I I always say it's my co my Comic Con family and North Carolina for me, when I say that Bull City and Oak City are, are like coming home, it truly is like coming home because I never feel like I'm someone that's hired into a con, which in the big con, sadly, that is you become a number of among sure. the numbers of people that are coming as guests. But North Carolina, it's, it's like literally coming in to your own home, sitting down on a couch and your mom, dad walk in the door. Like that's how it feels when I come to North Carolina Comic Con every year between the fans and the, the team that runs it and then just everyone like it's just like this big hug it just hugs me even without even without hugging me. it's great <laughs> <laughs> well i know from my time uh on the staff there and doing the things that i did with north carolina comic-con that that was one of the most important things i learned from the staff there is i i feel con should all be that way. I, I know that some companies we got to make our money and we do at the end of the day, but that I feel making that environment where we're not numbers, um, but we are family just is what our, what our hobbies are about, what our fandoms are actually about that everybody gets to open up and let their guard down a little bit in that environment. And I've always cherished that. And I've made amazing friendships um, from those things because you all are my extended nerdy geeky family and it's super amazing i'm but, pretty sure most of the adult friendships i've made in the last seven or eight years have been from comic cons yep um yeah. <laughs> yeah, i'm fine with that 
Hector and I know each other because because of a Comic Con, because of Oak City Comic Con. That's that's where him and I met um, over three years ago, and got into this crazy thing where I found out I can combine my faith with my nerdy comic book stuff, and it still blows my mind that I'm able to do both of those things. So maybe something that could help us all. Um, how about you go back to the beginning? What what made you want to do all of this stuff? Um, was there something in your childhood that leaned you into the sciences? Um, yeah. What where was the base? Where did you come from? I smell an origin story. <laughs> yes. I love this. So um, so my mom and dad met. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> I I grew up in eastern North Carolina, you know, in a in literally a no stoplight town that if you blinked, you missed it. Um, and so my parents were both Marines. And so being kind of in a transient transplant family, like I very much like found my my way in life through books and through comics and my dad would deploy all the time but he'd come back and he'd always bring on vhs recorded new um episodes of star trek so i grew up a trekkie uh my mom was yes. my mom was a, i will have to say that my mom uh was a huge star wars fan so we did learn very early on that you don't have to choose both are good um but i do That's lean right. way more towards um towards the trekkie side of my life uh i mean it may have something to do with the fact that my first on-screen crushes were Spock and Worf, but you know we won't get into that. Um, but so my dad. It's an interesting combination. We might come I back. To say, to that. I was about to say that's a, that's a pretty diverse crush range. <laughs> I, I, I feel I feel a little more drawn to Worf than Spock, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, so my dad uh, being deployed a lot, you know, when he came home, that was, that was how we bonded. We bonded by watching Star Trek or we were out in the garage working. You know, my dad was one of those jack of all trades and was flipping houses before flipping houses was a thing. So when you have little tiny hands, you're really good at pulling wires through conduit and you're really good at reaching an engine blocks and getting the things that have fallen through. So before I was even knee high to a duck, I was sitting in, inside of a car hood working with him and... I, I never even realized that what I was doing was being a builder or that what I was loving with my innate curiosity and my need to take everything apart and figure out either how to put it back together or how to combine it with something else to make something cooler was a form of engineering and science. Um, to the point that, like, again, I, I grew up in the 80s in the deep south. I mean, the debutante south, right? So as a girl that had short <laughs> hair and liked to build... I hid a lot of those things because it wasn't it wasn't really smiled upon. You know, we weren't even allowed to take shop as girls. We were we were forced into home ec when I was in school. And so it wasn't until I was a sophomore in college that I had a professor sit me down and talk to me about how my math and science scores were off the charts. But why was I pursuing a history degree? And the truth was, is that I was I was thinking history to Jack. You know, I was going to go the military path that my parents had gone. And she was like, have you ever thought about engineering? And I literally laughed at her and said, I don't think girls do that because Scotty from Star Trek was the only engineer that I knew. <laughs> and so <laughs> as a sophomore in college, I went up to NC State. I sat in on a material science class for the first time. I felt challenged. I felt excited about learning. And I was like, this is what I'm doing. So I went the engineering route, um, transferred out. And like that's, you know, I joke, you know, I'm a history major that got really lost on the way to graduation. But it was something that was really uh, amazing and life changing for me. Um, and it's been something that I get asked all the time, like, when did you know you were a scientist? When, when did you know? And, and I'm like, I, I did not actually know until someone was like, hey, <laughs> you're an engineer when you do that thing that you do that everyone yells at you for because you're taking things apart and not putting them back together right. <laughs> Why do I have extra parts? Does this screw go somewhere? <laughs> It's okay. I improved upon it every time. <laughs> Reverse engineering, by the way, is what that's called versus breaking it, which is what everyone else likes to call it. It's called reverse engineering. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing that down so I can use that one later. <laughs> you should. But yeah, so I... Because um, I break, I break uh, reverse engineer a lot of things. I, me too. See, and so I... Um, <laughs> 
I went down this path for engineering and it's kind of funny, you know, as a female engineer, you're, you're warned by the, the women that come before you that you need to, you need to climb fast because the minute you get a ring on your finger or a child in a home, you suddenly are not able to get um, promoted, which sadly is still the case in a lot mm -hmm. of engineering fields, especially traditional chemicals where I was working. And so I kind of gave myself the goal of hitting the E-suite by 30 and at 28 was a global marketing director reporting into CEO launching a global division. And so in 2015, uh, between having hit my career goal and looking around and realizing that I was the only woman for like four tiers of management, um, I decided it was time to go into consulting engineering and full-time outreach. So 2015, I hit the road mm -hmm. full-time to get more kids interested in STEM. And it's funny, my initial goal was to get more girls. And then after I joined the Mythbusters franchise, I had so many parents come up to me and tell me how by being equal to the men on the show, I was affecting the outlook of their sons that I realized that what I was doing had a larger impact than I could ever imagine. And so um, mm. it's been one of those things that through my outreach, you know, I and my nerddom, um, I got the opportunity with Jeremy to um, start talking about superhero science. I actually I did a free comic book stay in North Carolina. And so I did Marvel at superhero science and I showcased to all the kids uh, what PhDs and science um, education their heroes already had. And I showed them some really cool experiments. I did magnetic slime to show how symbiotes like venom could wrap around a person. And I did dry ice for storm and you know, it's one of those things that when you tell a kid, like, here's Einstein, he's this old dude, and he's invented a ton of stuff. Aren't you excited about science? They, they just kind of like glaze over. But if you're <laughs> like, hey, did you know that the Hulk is Bruce Banner? And Bruce Banner has this many PhDs in these subjects, and he's a scientist, and all science superheroes, like their powers and their tech is all based on STEM. They're suddenly really, really excited to talk about it. And then you add into it that comics are automatically diverse. They're inclusive. There are orange people. There are brown people. There are purple people. There are people that are not are non-binary. Like there is everyone that you could possibly need. So a child can always find someone to connect with in a comic. And then you take it even further to the fact that you can get free comics during free comic book days. You can get 99 cent comics. Most digital copies are $1.99. And then you start seeing that it's now approachable. You can get these comics in the hands of anyone. And so it was a perfect union for me to be able to bring my passion and love for sci-fi and comics, and then my love of engineering and science to then morph that into being able to talk to kids about stuff that they were already excited about to then in turn, get them excited about science. You can just tell from the energy of that. This is what you were called to do. This is, this is your, this is your spot. And I've seen you in panels and, and we've talked before. And I think one of the things I'm curious about is cause we've, we've talked about it in other places, but we want to share with this audience is, um, there's a bit of faith that plays into, um, who you are as well. Um, what, what's that look like? And was that part of your upbringing? Is that something that you found a little later? Yeah. So it's super, um, funny, um, I obviously, I'm in the science community, right? And so sadly, yep. it is something that my my faith comes up a lot. Um, but I have found that because I am a diehard fan of the Lord, I, I don't have any issues. Like a lot of people talk out about, oh, scientists are atheists and, and, and all of this. And I've met a lot of people that, that are, or that may just be agnostic and I've, I've always said, like, I'm, I'm not out in the world trying to convert everyone. I'm just a light for him in the world. And people see who I am and what I am and what I do through him. And it opens their hearts and it opens their minds. And, you know, I moved from the Bible Belt to California, which my, mom mm -hmm. loves to call the the place of fallen souls and she prayed so much <laughs> oh for me my. um and it's one of those things that i i do i pray before i go on every set i pray before i go into every con i pray before i go into any event that the lord bring to me the people that need to see his light 
and that he bring the people that I'm supposed to meet. Um, I also have tattooed on my forearm. Um, it was then that I carried you. Um, obviously it's from the Christian footprints poem. My mom had it up in the house and it's something that I wear uh, literally my face on my sleeve and people, especially in LA love to talk about tattoos. And so it's something that yep. they either very quickly get excited about or they quickly walk away. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine with, with them being where they're at, you know, and I understand that they'll get there when they're supposed to, and that the Lord has brought me in that moment to be just another indicator for them. Um, but it is something that I care a, a lot about. And it's kind of funny because in the, um, and during Mythbusters, the search was, was the competition series that really got everything to be where it's at. Um, every time I got an MVP, which was, I got it, I got them twice, uh, throughout the series was the only two MVP winner, only female finalists. And I would say, mm -hmm. I would talk about mm -hmm. how blessed I was to be there and how, how, you know, this was where I was meant to be and that I was only there to showcase to, to the young girls in science that they could be whatever they want to be, that no one could define that for them. And, it's kind of funny. Um, there was a moment during the search where a 45 pound weight, which at that point becomes a mortar, gets shot into the air. And Alan Pan actually goes, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And it turns out to be bleeped when they aired it. And Alan's like, what did they do? Why did they make it look like I was cursing? <laughs> he's like, I was, he's like, I was just trying to not to die. And so it was like one of those moments that we're like, yeah, why did they bleep that out? And then you start paying attention to like the edits. And it is something that sadly becomes edited out a lot of, out of a lot of science television, out of a lot of television in general. Um, which kind of breaks my heart that, you know, us talking about our Lord is, is in some respects looked at like someone cursing. Um, but you know, the, powers that TV or the powers that TV. And as we were talking about, TV is going the way of the dinosaur. Um, and so, you know, luckily YouTube and digital is not as edited and we get to talk about our faith whenever we want to. Um, so it's, it's something that I, I feel very strongly about. I'm always brought these amazing people. Um, I mean, literally every set, there hasn't been a single one that someone that isn't a huge believer or someone that didn't say, well, you know, I don't really know what that's like. Like, can we talk about it? You know, it hasn't been brought to me and it, and it just always makes me smile. It makes me know that I'm where I'm supposed to be, you know? So that's, um, I'm married to a scientist. And so a pastor married to a scientist in our region is really a fun dynamic. And, um, so it's really cool just to hear another scientist, you know, just be that passionate about it because, that's one of my things my wife would do is she's on the more medical end of the science world, but she, uh, you know, she, one of her favorite things to do is like to deconstruct the human eye and point out how like fascinatingly made the eye is. And that's like one of her topics of discussion for faith and things like that. So it's, it really is neat to be able just to see that and to share it and play it off. Like what it means to you in your world. So thank you for being awesome in that. And just using your platform to encourage people with everything you're doing. Well, well, thank you for what you guys are doing. Cause I'm loving sharing those. And because so many of my followers are, are either in the con community or in the science community and the tech community, like the amount of like messages I get daily when I share, I'm going, don't ever stop sharing these. Like I needed this today. I needed to see this. And I'm always like, well, you guys could go follow them too, you know, but <laughs> I think it's one of those things that clicking through a story for some reason nowadays has become the faster way to look at Instagram. But yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, like when you don't care enough to actually have to scroll through five pictures, you can just hit a thing and let it do it. For yeah. You. <laughs> um, um, how, like, I, I know that the stuff that you do, like, as far as your science and your talks at the shows is important. Um, if you don't mind me asking about the magic wheelchair, too, how, how did you get involved with that? And um, because I, I could just say that that's that's one of my favorite things about these shows, uh, especially, you know, North, you know, Bull City, Oak City, the North Carolina Comic Con shows. It's just seeing this. I work with some kids, you know, that are in very similar situations. And that's one of my favorite things is to just take photos from shows or get stickers and things and take home to those kids. Cause you know, it just makes their world better. So how did you get involved with that? Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, so my, 
well, she's my youngest niece, but about to be my, but not my youngest niece anymore in November. Um, she was born with a, a large scale of congenital heart defects to the point that when she was for, first born, she immediately went to heart surgery. And then at three months went again, and then at a year went again, you know? Um, and so for me, it's, it's been very important to be integrated in wherever I can with organizations that are helping children that are born with different abilities. Um, and so I had already gotten aligned with um, Camp Del Corazon, which is here in California, and they take kids that are born with congenital heart defects, and they take them to this camp, and they let them jump off of buildings and things like that. Let them do the things that their parents who see them as breakable don't, but they have this team of like surgeons there to make sure that if anything goes wrong, the kids are fine. Um, so I had already been incorporated into that. And then I had the joy of talking with part of the Tested team. There's this woman, Kristen Lohman, say, who is a producer on Tested and she was a producer for the OG Mythbusters. So her and Adam Savage have worked closely together and she's been a really great uh, mentor and connection for me through the last four years. And she knew about my love of cosplay and she knew about my love of working with kids with different abilities. And she's like, have you ever heard of this organization, Magic Wheelchair? I was like, you know, I have it. And she's like, you know, Adam's emceed a couple of their events at San Diego. I think that it would be a good connection for you. And so she connected me with the team at Magic Wheelchair and it became something that it was an immediate thing. I'm like, okay, as a maker, as a cosplayer, as a lover of human beings, of, as someone that is just wanting to work with kids every day, this organization and what it's doing is just so amazing. I want to help in any way I can. And so obviously they have their MCs and their connections on the West Coast being from um, Portland, but they did not have connections on the East Coast. And so I was talking to them about how, how this movement has become so much bigger than they ever thought. You know, it started out as a mom and dad that wanted to help their kids with different abilities be what they wanted to be for Halloween. And then it's just grown from there to the point where it's a, it's across the nation. They're trying to find builders and volunteers anywhere that they can. And they're trying to help all these kiddos that they're getting requests from. And so I was like, you know, do you guys have any connections in North Carolina? And they're like, you know, we don't. And I was like, do you have kiddos in North Carolina? And they're like, actually, we do. We have a lot of kiddos in North Carolina. We just don't have the connections. And I was like, I started working the year before with North Carolina Comic Con at Bull City. And I reached out to the organizers. And I was like, I would love to make this connection for you guys because I want to help the kiddos of my home state. And so through that, I've gotten the opportunity now to work with them um, at three different events with with North Carolina Comic or two with North Carolina Comic Con because we did Bull City last year, we did Oak City this year, um, and then I've been able to go and see their reveals at other cons as well. And it's one of those things that when you see the look in these kiddos' eyes when they unveil, it is just truly incredible. Like the first year. They used one of the Frank Miller old school Batman mobiles and there was a button on it that would go, I'm Batman. And for a lot of these kids, they're nonverbal. So having a button, like not only having a Batmobile that's got guns, but also having a button that then allows you to be like, I'm Batman as you're like parading around. Like that's huge for them. And they get, they, he got so excited. The look on his face, like I think that became like the poster for the entire con after that because he was just so excited. And then this year we actually, we had Ian and we built, um, it was, oh man. The Weasley the, car? It was the Weasley car. I'm trying to remember the builder's name right now. Um, oh gosh. And it's funny. I can see his Instagram handle, but I can't grab his name, but Jeff, Jeff. So Jeff works at a um, local technical school. And last year he, he built a, one of the Star Wars mobiles for one of the kids. And this year he did this amazing Weasley car. And it was so great because Ian was a first time driver. So we had to kind of give him a little driving course there in the auditorium. And the first thing he did was start doing donuts, which I feel like was the first thing I did when I got my license. I was like, I'm just going to go around in circles because that seems like what you should do in a car. Um, and then Absolutely. his his mom was so great. She was telling me, she's like, I'm so afraid he's going to run into a Lego table. And I was like, don't worry. Those are in the back, back <laughs> room. That'll be fine. And so all of a sudden he speeds off and she's like, oh, he's got it in outdoor mode. And we're like trying to run, run him down <laughs> because he's got it on full speed and he's laughing and just the the happiness in his eyes was like this is this is why it's all done this is what it's all about you know and so 
being a part of that organization and, and trying to find any help that I can and make any connections that I can for them has just been such a joy because they, they're truly incredible what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I did a call out to makers and cosplayers, builders, tech schools, just everyone like volunteer, sign up to volunteer. Like it's incredible what the difference that you'll make in one of these kiddos lives. Like, that's fantastic. And seriously, thank you, because I know that, you know, you have provided just, I mean, your presence draws a lot of attention to it beyond just what it would be if you weren't there. So I've, I've really appreciated that. Just, I know you bring a lot to the con community in general, between your knowledge, between the way that you're so engaging and that you actually, cause it's not knocking anybody in particular in saying this, but like when you've got someone that bring has so much to offer, but they barely care that they're there, it's, it doesn't help anything, but you are so engaging just at the shows I've seen you at and following your Instagram and stuff like you, you care basically everywhere you're at <laughs> and what you're doing. You put like 110% into it. So I'm really grateful just for what you're doing with that. Well, thank you. It's, it's an and honor it's so to be a amazing. part of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's that's why we love you, that all this wonderful of science, of caring, and that faith is the piece that kind of weaves together a lot of the things is just so amazing. It's, I mean, it's why Hector and I do what we do, and we're always just super excited to meet other folks that are doing other amazing things. So as we wrap up and we respect your time, we know that you also are working on a brand new comic. And I think some of our fan base would be super excited to hear a little bit about how you got, how you decided to do that and what, what exactly it's about. We'll let you pitch that Hector and I have read it. It's pretty awesome. So we want to hear you tell us a little bit about that wonderful book. Yeah. So it's called Seekers of Science, SOS for short. And it has been a two year journey. You know, anyone that has not written or, done the art of or decided to produce a comic let me tell you like be ready because it is a lot <laughs> but it is so rewarding you know getting to see it out in the community and and we like literally were like oh my gosh it's real now it's actually real like people are seeing it people are touching it it's out there um but it started gosh I met Dr. Tracy Finara, who I'm, I'm co-producing it with on Mythbusters A Search. And we actually, we bonded over our faith because, you know, we did have some counterparts on the show that were atheists. And there was a lot of heckling because it's a competitive series that would go on in, in a way that, you know, really kind of rocked us as, as people of faith. And, we were, and it was nice that we had each other to find solace and be like, you know what? That has like that's has nothing to do with anything. We're here and we know our faith and we know who's with us and who has our back through all of this, you know. And so her and I, we bonded over faith, we bonded over science, we bonded over our love of inspiring others to to see the exciting world that is around them, because that's really what science is all about, is just staying curious and open to the world around you and asking questions and figuring out how things work. Um and it's like, God's produced this beautiful world around you. So why wouldn't you want to like take it all in, you know? And so we, we kind of started this journey together. And, you know, she's always been Inspector Planet where she's like, um, doing these fun posts and these fun videos to try to get people excited about saving the world. And then I've always been my superhero, hero scientist self. Um, and so we had this incredible writer, Todd Black, who had been following us and we had been talking with and engaging with for a while about other series that he had kind of be like, you know, if you guys ever want to like do, do something like, let me know. And we both were like, actually, we want, we want to do, we want to do a comic. We want to do a science comic. Like, how do we do that and make it so it's something people actually want to read? Like, we want to make a difference. And it ended up being one of those things that heartbreakingly at the time, um, Unstoppable Wasp by Jeremy Whitley was, was getting discontinued. And it broke our hearts right. so much because when we would go to science camps and, and we would do these science talks across the nation, we would tell everyone about Jeremy's comic. And we're like, you should get this, you should get this, you should get this. And so Jeremy had highlighted Tracy and I in one of, in one of the actual, the Unstoppable Loss, I think it was volume four or issue four in the first volume, I mean. And so we reached out to him. And we're like, this is breaking our heart. Like we want to be able to make sure that 
little girls are inspired, like, would you mind if we borrowed some of the ideas that you did here, but incorporated them into what, what we want to do? And so we, we kind of came up with this idea for a comic that is, it's a MacGyver-esque situation where two engineers, me and Dr. Fennard, take on real world problems, utilizing real science and real tech. And what we borrowed from Jeremy is the fact that we throw in little SOS facts. So he's really amazing and unstoppable wasp about anytime he shows something that's technical, he does a little pop out and, and explains what the technology means. So we do that with verbiage. Like if we say CDC, we, we put in center for D D disease control. If we say nanobots, we put in 10 to the negative ninth. You know, we, we tell them what these things mean so that science becomes approachable. It becomes something that everyone can understand. Um, and then we also borrowed from him the highlighting of real living scientists. So we do a Q&A in the back of ours, just like he does. But we took it one step further. And because we are taking on real world problems, we bring in experts in that field and they actually become characters with us. Um, so in each issue, you've got us tackling a real world problem with real life, uh, what we call citizen scientists. And those are young people that want to make a difference, but may not have their degree yet and real life science experts in the field. And then at the end, you get to hear from those experts about why they chose that path, what, um, what abilities they had class wise that kind of lent to it. And then one of the things for me that was so important is I want kids to be able to get their hands dirty and be a part of this. So in each issue, there's a less than $5 DIY at home products way for them to replicate it. So issue one is an oil spill. So they get to use vegetable oil, water, cotton balls, and Dawn dish soap and learn how to make their own absorbers and make their own surfactants that can actually break down the oil and clean it up. And then in issue two, there, it's a, about a viral outbreak. So I showcase to them utilizing lotion and glitter, why you need to wash your hands with warm water and sing row, row, row your boat at least two times to actually get them off. And they get to see why yes. tissues don't work and why <laughs> cold water doesn't work. And it becomes one of those things that now, again, we have a comic that we're able to get into the hands of everyone. And so we give these out. We have jelly bands that glow in the dark, which the kids love. Um, they say Seekers of Science, yeah, SOS really on bad. the outside. On the inside is a digital link and they get the first two issues for free. And we're running it kind of like a That's SpaceX awesome. Tom's model for every dollar we make, we reinvest it. And for every issue bought, we donate. We've already donated over like, I think at this point, we're up to like 1500 issues across the nation in the last month. And we just got the website up. So like purchasing is just now starting, which is hilarious. Um, so it's, it's kind of been an adventure. And, you know, issue two is done, which people know because the kids are getting it, but we're not going to release it until a little bit later in the year. And then and issue three is written and we're about to start art on that issue four, five, and six. We already have our experts for and our ideas for. So it's just, you know, as the money's coming, we're, we're funneling it back in and we're getting it out to the kids. But I know it's interesting. Um, one of the things I talked about at con though, is that something that's keeping me up at night a lot is that 35% of the nation still doesn't have access to internet in the home. And so mm -hmm. we're trying mm -hmm. to get these comics into the hands of kids that may not otherwise see themselves in science represented in media or represented by the people around them. And how do we get them into their hands has been the big question on my mind. So I'm starting to try to get contacts with um, the public library system, the public school system, other nonprofits um, to just find a way to be able to get these digital copies and hard copies somewhere that kids can get them. And libraries is the answer I have right now, but we know long-term our hope is to be able to get grants so that we can give hard copies to kids. Uh, anyone that's printed comics knows that's not an ex uh, inexpensive endeavor, but Oh, we, no. Um, no, especially when all. it's a 24 pager, um, which we're talking about making a four page, like little like synopsis maybe to give out with the jelly bands. But we want to make sure that everyone can see these and everyone can have these. And so it's, it's a continuing work in progress. We're, we're taking help everywhere we can get it. Ideas are where we can get it. I actually, um, the, the, PR marketing person from Matter Hackers was the one that was like, I have a contact at the national level for libraries. Let me get it to you. So it's really been the support of our supporters that's enabling us to get this further. And 
we know 100% it's because of our faith and just continually putting it up to God and being like, God, how do we, how do we fix this? How do we get this to everyone? How do we get this out there? Like, just show us the way, you know? So. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the first, I, I read the first issue and I thought, you know, this is really neat. I've got an 11 year old daughter that loves science and she really enjoyed it as well. And, you know, it's got the, for me, oh, it had the, this isn't any kind of negative statement. I hope it doesn't come that way. It felt like Captain Planet yes. for a new That's generation. That's good, yes. <laughs> uh, it, it felt like, it felt like a, a, a cross between Captain Planet and the Wild Kratts, like somewhere in there. That's like the science, like my daughter grew up on Wild Kratts. I grew up on Captain Planet. And I was like, this can be the next thing. Um, so I, I, was re- I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you're doing That's that. A- um, I do have one question okay. though. Superhero crossover. Ooh. You have the opportunity to, to cross over one mainstream comic book character into your book. Who uh, we it? obviously bring in Nadia, the Unstoppable Wasp, without a question. Like Jeremy has been okay. such a big deal for us. So that's definitely going to happen. We have actually been talking to, we're going to do a Scooby-Doo crossover. We hinted at it in issue one, but Halloween issue is <laughs> going to be a Scooby-Doo crossover. We already know we want to make that. Um, so it's definitely because of those meddling kids we literally say that we're like you would you would have gotten through it without us meddling kids right we (laughs) yeah you did yes (laughs) oh that's the best well we want to respect your time we know that you've got a lot going on and we just really wanted to thank you for coming and hanging out with us today and sharing all all of the amazing things that you're doing in nerd culture in science and, and even in faith and just showing the world that all three of those things are not mutually exclusive. We're always excited when we meet other folks that have figured out that we, we can be all of those things and we're, we're not weird. We're not more weird than we yeah, are like, naturally. Yeah. Weird. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I usually tell people that too. I'm like, it's, it's weird. Right. And they're like, yeah, you're kind of weird. I'm like, that's not what I meant anyway. Um, but Thank, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, where can people find you on the interwebs if they're looking for you? Um, so I'm the real Tamara Robertson now on Instagram and um, at TLNR85 on Twitter. And um, I think Facebook is still that one. It might be the real as well. I'm doing a little bit of a shift right now because of people grabbing my identity. Um, but the biggest, the biggest thing yeah. would be is go to, go to SOS.comicbook on Instagram and you will find all of my links as well as Dr. Fanara's. And then uh, seekersofscience.com is where you can find everything important right now in my life. <laughs> and and we'll try to get as many of those into the show notes as well so folks can find you. But again, thank you so much for coming and being part of this this week. So that's it for us here at the Pull List Podcast. Episode 14 is now in the books and it's now in your ears. But we couldn't possibly do this alone. As many of you know, we take this epic journey of podcast and fandom with two other amazing podcasts that are part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Humans of Gaming with Drew and Chris does interviews with game designers, producers, and creators, and really gets to the heart of why they do what they do. And Bubba, Matt, and Kate bring us the Free Play Podcast that covers just about everything nerdy and everything in between and lots of other things that are incredibly geeky. It's super fun. There's lots of beards present in that. I know you can't see that on a podcast, but you can almost feel it come through the microphone. It's really weird. There's lots of beards there. Um, But no joke, it's funny. It's all fun. But most of all, it's based on faith. And that's what we're about at Love Thy Nerd. And we're excited to be part of the Love Thy Nerd podcast network. So... Again, Hector and I want to thank you for choosing us as your primary source of all things comic booky and generally nerdy on a near weekly basis. So don't leave us hanging. Rate and review the show on your podcasting app of choice. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and many, many others. Can't find us? Let us know at the pull list podcast at lovethynerd.com or look for us at the pull podcast.com. Thanks for listening. And remember, kids, read more comics. You've been listening to The Pull List Podcast with Chris Poirier and Hector Mira, part of the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. Be sure to rate and review the show and share on all the social media. The master of epic duels. I can feel.